This is Hearing Pain, a programme brought to you by Pain Concern, the UK charity providing information and support for those of us living with pain and for healthcare professionals. I'm Paul Evans and this edition has been aided with a grant from the Pain Alliance Northern Ireland. Now, the Alliance brings together all those members of, let's call us the Pain family, together with members of the Northern Ireland Assembly to raise awareness of the burden of long-term pain in Northern Ireland and to press for improvement in services. Three years ago, they held the first Northern Ireland Pain Summit to raise awareness of the extent of the problem of people living with chronic pain, the cost to the economy, and to highlight to those decision makers key opportunities to develop prevention strategies and services for people with chronic pain. You can download edition 35 of Airing Pain to hear what was discussed and decided in 2012 from Pain Concern's website, which is painconcern.org.uk. So let's spin forward to 2015 and the second Northern Ireland Pain Summit, which was held once again in Belfast. Dr Pamela Bell is a retired consultant in anaesthesia and pain management, and she's chair of the Pain Alliance Northern Ireland. So. What's been achieved in these last three years? One of the very big things to come out of the last pain summit uh, was the undertaking by the Patient and Client Council to carry out a survey of the experience of people living with long-term pain and how they felt about the services that are available for them here in Northern Ireland. And that was eventually published in uh, February of last year as The Painful Truth. And that set out a great deal of information highlighting the burden that chronic pain places on our population in terms of not just the physical uh, handicap of chronic pain, but also the emotional and socioeconomic problems. I'm Maureen Edmondson and I have the privilege of chairing the Patient and Client Council in Northern Ireland. The Patient and Client Council was set up to be really the critical friend in the health and social care system in Northern Ireland. And our statutory duty is to listen to the voice of the patient, find out what they're thinking about the service they're receiving or not receiving, and feed that back into the system at all levels. Are you a governmental organisation? Yes, we are. We are part of the health and social care family. We're funded by the health and social care system, but we have an independent voice which comes from the people we talk to and we talk to thousands of people each year and feed their voices back into the system. And when you feed those voices back, are they listened to? On the pain issue, we are really thrilled that, in fact, three years ago we issued the report The Painful Truth and had a number of recommendations in that because pain, chronic pain was not recognised as a condition within the system. So we were delighted that when we wrote to the minister and sent the copy of the report to him, that actually seven of the 10 recommendations in that report were taken up. And so now you actually do have, first of all, chronic pain recognised as, a, as a, an issue that needs to be dealt with and a condition that has massive effect on people's lives. So that's recognised. There's now education for, for professionals in relation to pain. And there are also service users involved in developing the strategies and the care plans in relation to chronic pain. So we've moved a long way. Now we're on a journey and we're not there yet because this is a big system and there's lots of bits of the system. So there's lots more to go, but we're, we're getting there. I'm Louise Skelly. I'm Head of Operations for the Patient and Client Council. The Painful Truth was published in 2014, early 2014, and basically it was 2,500 patients or people with, who were sufferers of chronic pain told their story. They told their story not only in terms of the impact of chronic pain on their lives, but their experience of health and social care services. And that was a very explosive report in terms of what it had to say, a very human report. Patients and their carers were involved right from the start in the development of the study and are currently involved in the implementation of the rollout of the recommendations and that is really, really fundamental to the work that's happening at the moment. The patient voice, those personal stories, those are the experiences that really make people sit up. Absolutely. Uh, they're so human and also they're, they're the reality. Some of the patients I've been talking to today, for example, said they find it really hard to just be listened to by their GPs. You know, it doesn't take money to fix that. 
you know, and if we can change attitudes and, uh, you know, I think we're some way along that line, but we have a lot of work to do. My name's Carrie. Um, 27 year old. So you have a chronic pain condition? I do, yes. I have fibromyalgia and it leaves me with a lot of muscle pain and weakness and aside from the actual obvious pain and fatigue, it can be very debilitating and very isolating. It leaves me kind of, it fluctuates from day to day. I can always feel it. I can always feel pain and I can always feel weakness of some level um, and I just have to learn to kind of adapt to each day. How did your GP help you? <laughs> um, I don't know how to answer that without disrespecting them. <laughs> uh, they, I didn't get much help or support. They, my mum helped me. I was working as a nurse for the healthcare system and I collapsed in work one day and was that was the start of my fibro and I was bed bound for 12 weeks and it was only my mum kept pushing for the doctors and kept pushing that they they turned around and said to me that I just had to go to physio and go to some cognitive behavioural therapy and I'd be fine. So I jumped through all the hoops for them and I done everything they said and went back to them and says I'm still no better. Guys, I've done everything you said, can you please, you know, try and help me now and they just, they says here's some painkillers, this is you, learn to live with it. And I had to fight even to get painkillers and to get different types and different strengths and dosages. If it hadn't been for my mum, I think I would still be lying in the bed in the corner, no further forward. One of the big myths is that people with pain are malingerers, they want to spend, go on benefits and all of that. And this report very clearly showed that the last thing to go is people's work. Their social life will go first, then they will, uh, it'll affect their family life and they will do everything but give up their work and uh, it's the last thing to be impacted. So I think that was a very strong message right across government departments here in Northern Ireland as well. What did your Minister of Health say about it? Did he have any personal comments himself? At that time it was Minister Poots. What he had to say really was that he endorsed the stories there and he said this was a situation that couldn't really continue and his department was now charged with taking forward the uh, recommendations which he had endorsed. They issued a letter formally along that line. That was Louise Skelly, Head of Operations for the Patient and Client Council in Northern Ireland. Maeve McLaughlin, MLA, that's Member of the Legislative Assembly, is Chair of the Northern Ireland Assembly Health Committee. Clearly there is a challenge when we look at the amount of people who suffer from chronic or constant pain in our society. The statistics tell us that one in five people suffer. So there is a very clear need for the system to be able to respond to that need that's there. Uh, I suppose on a very human level today, we'll hear directly from patients themselves, from service users themselves, and there are clear messages coming from them all that are saying we do need a strategy that actually looks at the whole area of pain and the types of services and interventions that are required. So that, I think, is a clear message coming out of this today. There has been progress. Uh, we need to see the whole issue of how we tackle chronic pain and constant pain further up the political agenda. The Painful Truth report that came out last year, the Northern Ireland Assembly accepted seven out of the ten recommendations. How are those being implemented? Part of the challenge that we have in relation to this issue and many, many other issues has been the way our system is currently set up. Uh, I think clearly in order to be able to fully implement the recommendations coming from that report and indeed coming from many other reports, we need a system that can respond, we need a system that can proactively um, strategize. We need a system that is very clear in terms of who's in charge and where the accountability is. Uh, we don't need a system as it's currently configured that you know, almost feels as if um, they are at odds with one another, that there is a certain policy direction and then what happens on the ground is something very different. So I would be hopeful that the, whilst there has been progress from the Painful Truth report, that we will see more once this reform of the system actually kicks in. Healthcare is about money as much as patients. Sadly, I'm a patient, you're a politician. One department is cut, 
for another department to take money from that? Well, I think the first thing I would say in relation to this is health has been protected. I think the big issue in health, well, there are two big issues. First of all, the dire need to reform the system. It's overly bureaucratic. It's complex and, and there is duplication in the system. But part of the challenge then is actually where the spend goes. And whilst I think we could all and should all make a case for additional money at times, depending on need, we also need to be mindful of a system that pays 34 million to senior consultants for bonuses at a time when you can't recruit the types of frontline staff who could assist, for example, with chronic pain. Um, so there is a clear challenge in the system about moving towards a process that actually is a public health model that is very patient-centred and patient-outcome focused. My name is Margaret Peacock and I represent Fibromyalgia Northern Ireland as the Director for Northern Ireland. Why I'm so passionate about fibromyalgia is I am a sufferer and have been diagnosed since 1997, so I am indeed living quite a while with the actual illness. The fact that you were diagnosed in the first place 17 years ago, you have a diagnosis, that in itself is remarkable. Well, yes. <laughs> It wasn't easy, let me assure you. I had, for two years, as they say in drama, I had busted the boards. That's not the right terminology, but I'd, I'd tried every consultant that I was told about that may help me. In fact, I saw six privately. And on the seventh, I was diagnosed with the illness, as far as I'm concerned. It took a while, especially when you're emotionally in torment with pain and you just don't know what to do the next day. And it's, it really is a really, really, really chronic illness. What are you picking up from the politicians speaking and the healthcare professionals speaking? Well, if I could give a, a varied opinion, I have attended many conferences, I have attended many meetings and it's a struggle and I'm not picking up a great deal, sadly, again that could be a personal opinion, not a professional, but I would like to see movement and I don't mean movement in, oh yes we understand it is quite chronic to have fibromyalgia, I mean movement where people will get together, the powers that be I'm talking about, and will get together and do something to help the many sufferers that they are in Northern Ireland. My name is Dr Anne Kilgallen and I'm a Deputy Chief Medical Officer at the Department of Health here in Belfast. And I've been invited to speak at today's event really to give some insight into the policy perspective on long-term pain and, how, and our approach to developing and delivering services for people who live with long-term pain. So what did you tell the delegates? What I told the delegates was that uh, probably the most significant um, impact on our policy has come from the painful truth. And the power of that report lay in the f lies in the fact that not only does it uh, represent in survey and in statistical form the realities of um, uh, people who are living with long-term pain, but it also presents the human face because they're very personal and very real stories. And it made that report made, I think, 10 recommendations. For me, probably the most important of which was a recommendation that long-term pain would be regarded as a long-term condition. And immediately on publication, our department, the minister and our department accepted that recommendation and has moved to ensure that within our long-term conditions policy framework, long-term pain is now considered as a chronic condition. What does it mean that long-term pain, chronic pain, is a condition in its own right? The significance of that framework is that it charges us in health and social care with reorienting our services from episodic care to wrapping ourselves around or supporting people who live with chronic long-term conditions. So it's a significant policy framework for us. And within that then, the fact that certain conditions are preeminent um, really allows us to, to identify populations for whom the policy is relevant. One of the difficulties, I think, for people who've lived with long-term pain is often a difficulty with the diagnosis. Historically, pain itself was not considered a diagnosis. The question might be, what is the cause of that pain? And, and so the fact of recognising long-term pain as a condition in its own right and of putting it in, the, in our policy context charges us with partnership 
with patients, partnership with people and with their families. So developing our services in such a way that they are supportive of the individual in the long term and not just in the episode when they might be particularly vulnerable or particularly in need of a health or social care service. So by giving chronic pain a label, it is a condition. It's almost like a mandate to politicians that they have to get it sorted. I think the reality is that, and many people have said this before me, that a problem isn't a problem until it is named. And so, in fact, the, yes, it is true that recognising chronic or long-term pain as, as what it is, a long-term condition in its own right, does allow us to really formally think about the services we provide. And in particular, this issue of supporting people in their daily lives and of really supporting them to self-manage. I think that's really the point of what I'm describing, is that rather than an individual coming to us for a service, the reality is this individual it needs to be supported and helped to manage the condition themselves with occasional or regular support from professionals. And that's, that's a partnership approach. My name's Tricia Bowers and I'm the Training Services Manager for Arthritis Care Northern Ireland and we deliver self-management programmes for people in the community who are living with long-term painful conditions. You were involved in the workshops earlier. What was your task? Our task was to look at self-management and come up with an idea or a feel for what does good self-management look like and then identify three or four priorities that we would like to have processed um, at the top of a list if there was a wish list for self-management. Well, Arthritis Care is already involved in very, very good self-management programmes. What were the findings of your discussions? You're quite right. We are at the forefront of delivering within the community sector and we get our funding from health trusts. We had a number of patients who are living with chronic pain, including myself, around the table. And they were talking to us very much about the frustrations that they have to live with in terms of waiting times for appointments to see a health professional. Even their GP, some, some of them were saying that they might have to wait up to three weeks to get a GP's appointment. Much longer for a rheumatologist or a pain clinic appointment and the fact that when you're living in long-term pain like that it is what it is it's a long-term condition and it doesn't go away it doesn't necessarily get that much better and it's really frustrating to be told that you might have to wait 18 months before you will see somebody who will be able to help you to manage the pain better i think it's very important to know as well that it doesn't matter what the long-term condition is, there are things that we all feel, the frustration, the daily grind and the feeling alone. Absolutely. And in fact, within Arthritis Care now, we have developed a project whereby those people who are so isolated that they can't attend community settings, we now have a one-to-one -one befriending service called Staying Connected, where we have trained volunteers who also have a long-term painful condition will go out and visit the people in their own homes and talk them through the self-management program, talk them through, as you say, the small changes that people can make to help them deal with the difficulties that they're having to live with on a daily basis, whether it's the pain, whether it's the fatigue, depression, low mood, all of those things. and that's turning into a very, very successful project currently. I'm Zara, so I am. I'm Amy. Zara and Amy, you've just given a fantastic talk to a room of 150 health professionals yeah. and you communicated what you go through with your chronic pain on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Amy, tell me what you told them. I was just discussing about my illness and what I have, it's juvenile idiopathic arthritis and just how I deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis and how it affects my life, so my social life and family life and school life and just how it restricts me from doing some of the things I want to and some also how I get around the restrictions that it causes. So how does it affect you? 
I struggle with stiffness in the mornings, so getting to school is quite a difficulty with, you know, stiffness, getting on the bus, getting in on time, and then once I do get to school, the pain is it's hard to concentrate in class with fatigue and pain together. And then when you get home, you're not really in the mood to go out because you're so tired and drained from the school day. So your social life suffers from that aspect. And while you're at home, you isolate yourself when you are in pain. So that also affects your family life in that way, where sometimes even when you are with your family, you're not quite 100% yourself. Zara, how does it affect you? Well, um, because I not only do I have arthritis, um, I'm missing the three fingers from my left hand and a joint in the middle finger of my right hand, and then I've developed tendonitis in the tendon along my right arm. Um, it definitely makes things a lot more difficult. I described myself as feeling like the Tin Man from The Wizard of Oz when he was first found by Dorothy because he needed uh, the special oil that he had to um, relieve him of pain and stiffness. The only difference being that I don't have the special oil. I talked about how it affected me when I was doing my GCSEs because I had to get a laptop so I could type up the majority of them as well as uh, having to like take a break every 45 minutes just to sort of stand up and stretch because it began to affect my knees and um, getting up and down off of the bus because with my bag um, on my back and the files in my hands I don't almost feel like I can support my weight which um, is definitely a it's it's not helpful because then I tend to hold people up on the behind me on the bus so you've had the opportunity and you did it very well to speak in this pain association Northern Ireland summit and there were a lot of health professionals there were politicians there as well what message do you think they took from what you were doing I hope that they took that obviously not just adults suffer from chronic pain that it affects everyone and usually in the same kind of way that it doesn't add up, but there's obviously some differences between teenagers dealing with chronic pain and adults dealing with it. But you know, it affects our school life rather than our work life. And I think a big thing for teenagers with chronic pain is they're embarrassed by it sometimes. I remember at the beginning, like if I had a limp one day, I'd be embarrassed limping up the stairs that somebody would see me and think that there was something wrong with me. But I think once you've had it for a certain amount of time, that doesn't really bother you anymore. You know, there's people who are like, you don't look sick, so why are you saying that you're sick? I think that's one of the big things with invisible illnesses. Nobody can really tell that you're sick until you tell them. So I think it's just one of those things that I hope that they understand that we are affected just as severely as any other person who's affected by a chronic illness. Yeah, I hope they also enjoyed the speech because I put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> I'm Gillian Coward. I'm a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, which I have experienced for over 30 years. What have you heard this morning that excites you or disappoints you? I've heard some very moving stories about people's experience of pain and quite an age range of pain. That's been very informative. People don't realize that it can affect young people as well as older people. I've heard a lot about change within our health service, particularly here in Northern Ireland, and how there is an awareness uh, amongst our politicians and uh, amongst our health professionals about getting people out of their silos and remembering that pain connects patients across very wide user groups. I'm hoping that events like this will lead to better understanding about treating pain. The Painful Truth document that came out last year, has that changed the way service users are treated? I think that document has had a very wide reach in political circles and in the health professionals field. And I think if you're aware of it as a service user, I'm very involved with arthritis care and we became aware of that document. It's a shared vision that we have. We're, we're trying to achieve those goals that are outlined in that document. And when you're either talking about your own situation on a, in, a, in a patient situation, you can 
perhaps uh, reach better outcomes because you're aware that the GP you're talking to or the physio you're talking to is aware of the, the goals and targets that we're all trying to, to do. I think for a service user with chronic long-term pain, you have an enormous amount of contact with the health service and often you know as much about your condition as the health profession you're dealing with. And so knowing what's achievable is important for both of us. And that document has helped in that way. I'm Christina McMaster. I'm a public health consultant. And together with my colleague, Maria Wright, we lead the pain forum in Northern Ireland, which is to take forward the recommendations from a scoping report we did in response to the painful truth. I've heard the word scoping many times today. Tell me what scoping is. In plain English, it's to look at what range and quantities of services for people with pain we have in Northern Ireland. And uh, the picture that we uncovered was a very mixed one. We had a little bit of everything, but not enough of anything anywhere. Huge variation and therefore inequity in services for patients with pain across Northern Ireland. Some health and social care trusts were relatively well equipped. Others were lacking in bare essentials. Now that we have that picture, it is relatively easy to identify all the things that need doing. To do all of those would cost an enormous amount of money and we need to start somewhere. So we are currently working with colleagues across Northern Ireland to identify priorities. And what I think is going to emerge is that we invest in more self-management in communities initially and at the same time develop capacity in primary care. We also need to find funding to close the huge gaps in our hospital services and I suppose there will be some opportunism in having plans for all of those things and then moving forward with what attracts the resources initially and that's not entirely in our own hands. No, but short-term planning, ploughing a lot of money into something now like self-management mm -hmm. will save an awful lot of money in the future. Mm -hmm. You're talking to a public health practitioner and that's exactly the message that I would put out first. Uh, prevention is better than cure. But we must be mindful of the fate of tens of thousands of people in Northern Ireland who live day and daily with very severe pain, who do need help. We have a duty to care and we do need to equip our colleagues in hospital services and in primary care to help those patients. Everything is a balance act and a compromise. So the agenda is huge, otherwise we couldn't have spent a whole day talking about it. We will have to make choices, but I think that will become clearer as we work. Christina McMaster, leader of the Pain Forum in Northern Ireland. I just remind you, as always, that whilst we in Pain Concern believe the information and opinions on airing pain are accurate and sound based on the best judgments available, you should always consult your health professional on any matter relating to your health and well-being. He or she is the only person who knows you, your circumstances and therefore the appropriate action to take on your behalf. So at the end of this, the second Northern Ireland Pain Summit, a lot of words have been spoken, lots of ideas developed and experiences shared. Final words to Pamela Bell, Chair of the Pain Alliance, Northern Ireland. I'm just staggered at the amount of work that has been done today and the number of messages. First of all, I'm really pleased at how well engaged the patients are. And I want to take some of that energy going forward because it's their voice that really seems to make the difference here in Northern Ireland. I'm also so pleased that healthcare professionals are continuing to follow us on this journey and seeing many faces here today that were at the original pain summit and uh, knowing where they have progressed in terms of how they're delivering the services. So that has been absolutely fascinating. We've learned a lot, I think, from what is going on in the journey that Wales and Scotland are undertaking. I think we're dragging a little bit behind them, I must admit, despite the progress that we've made, but it is heartening to know that they are still continuing on their particular journey. Out of the workshops, we have a lot of work to take forward. 
and I think that what we need to do now is take a little sit down with uh, those who ran the workshops and determine who takes which strand of the work forward. But I certainly feel we've got a mandate to push ahead with the educational organisations, with our health and social care board, with our Department of Health, with the Health Assembly, to encourage them to create the atmosphere where change for the positive benefit of patients can happen. So yes, I'm delighted, but almost too much coming out of it to encapsulate in a few words.